I'd like to start the session. Our first speaker will be Robin Hanel, who's president, who is professor emeritus at American University and cur currently in Portland, Oregon, at Portland State. Um, and he yeah. gets to talk on one of my favorite esoteric subjects, which is Piero Schraffa. And so Joan Robinson once said that she only met two gentlemen at Cambridge. One was an Italian and one was a communist. <laughs> Schraffa was the Italian. So, and the communist. Um, okay, first of all, uh, uh, sort of an announcement. Um, <clears throat> so the paper I'm giving, it's me, but I'm also newly the co-director of Economics for Equity in the Environment, AKA the, the, the E3 network. Um, and there's some handouts that are around, and anybody that didn't get one who's interested, I have a few other, I still have a few with me. Um, there's been some recent changes in economics for equity in the environment. There, we've relocated from the EcoTrust NGO in Portland, Oregon, to EESI, which is in Cambridge, Boston. There's two new co-directors, and there's some new people on our board. But basically, we're around. We're the same people. We're still a network of 400 more or less progressive environmental economists trying to <coughs> trying to work on ways to solve economic problems in an equitable, fair way. Um, so I wanted to be sure that I am not speaking on behalf of my fellow 400 um, E3 network economists. I'm sure there's not a single subject upon which all 400 of us disagree, and I can assure you that, that many of them would not necessarily agree with what I'm going to say today. Um, but so be it. Um, anyway, so, and the other thing I've done is, I mean, it's, this is a paper that I'm not going to be able to present in a compelling way, you know, in this time frame. But there are printed copies of it that are available. So if you are interested, that is the version, you know, that, that you want to go to. And there's a bunch of things that are in that version that I'm not even going to try and say. Um, finally, um, I suspect that this session is going to be rather controversial. Um, and I'm going to try and be very careful. Part of my... Part of my peeve here, part of the controversy is going to be that I think that people have been very sloppy about using the word growth. That doesn't matter unless it matters. But I also think it really matters that the way that people have been sloppy when they use the word growth really makes some important differences in the cause that I know we're all committed to. Um, so anyway, having said all that, let me begin. Um, <coughs> And I'm going to go straight to the meat of it. Here are a few famous quotes. What are we to make of statements like, infinite economic growth on a finite planet is impossible. Only a madman or an economist would think otherwise. Besides the fact that it's a great quote, um, what are we to make of that? What are we to make of pleas to substitute the goal of a steady state economy for the traditional goal of increasing economic growth? Herman Daly. What are we to make of the degrowth movement, which argues that we must reduce output to make our economies environmentally sustainable? Now, here's my argument in brief. The key to clear thinking on these subjects is understanding the difference between throughput and economic well-being. They're not the same thing. And the contribution of this paper is we need a model where you can rigorously, rigorously model economic well-being, increases in labor productivity, increases in throughput efficiency. Only in a model like that can you establish or hope to establish sufficient conditions for environmental sustainability. Now, I didn't start, I didn't start out my career as a, as a Srafian economist. Um, but I've increasingly discovered that a Srafian framework is actually remarkably well suited to dealing with some issues that all of us have struggled with. Um, I think Srafians have made a mistake, quite honestly. Um, I think that they needed to be much more explicitly, they needed to make their radical conclusions much more explicit. And they needed to actually embrace the task that any economics in the 21st century 
that does not help us deal and understand more sensibly the relationship between human economic activity and the environment that we are damaging to the point of no return is just not an economics that's worthy of anybody's attention. I think that Sraffians have not taken up that challenge. Um, so in part, I'm sort of dedicated to doing that. And I think that I've discovered their framework actually in some ways is remarkably helpful. Um, so my conclusion is that if we carefully interpret those quotes that are, that those warnings, um, if we carefully interpret them to be referring to growth of throughput, they can be very insightful indeed. On the other hand, if anyone claims that economic well-being per capita cannot continue to grow indefinitely, or that achieving environmental sustainability means that well-being per capita cannot grow or must decrease, I think that this is untrue and it's very, very politically debilitating to go out there and deliver that message. So let me go ahead and proceed. Um, there's basically two theorems that, um, <coughs> that I've proved in two forthcoming articles in the Review of Radical Political Economy. And the theorems concern changes in overall labor, labor productivity and overall throughput efficiency. And what they do is they make it possible to settle the issue of whether or not increases in economic well-being are compatible with maintaining throughput or decreasing throughput. Um, here's, where, here's why I handed the paper out. I don't have time to put the whole Strafa framework and model up on the board. And you wouldn't have time if you're not familiar with it to, you know, to, <coughs> to digest it in this time frame. Here's the key. In a complicated economy, um, we're talking about technological. The issue really is technological change. And <clears throat> what kinds of technology, what, tech what is the technological change, a particular technological change in a particular industry, how does that impact overall labor productivity in the economy as a whole? And how does that impact overall throughput efficiency in the economy as a whole. And it's not easy to come up with a way to actually rigorously measure those things. And yet I do think that at the root of the debate about to what extent is growth problematic from an environmental point of view and to what extent is growth, growth of economic well-being still possible within environmental constraints, that's exactly what you have to be able to do. And that's where my suggestion is, my god, this Rafa framework is actually admirable, admirably suited to this. What it turns out is that for any technological change you introduce in any industry, in the framework you can come up with a measure of how much, what, per, what is the percentage increase in labor productivity that that, that that brings about in the economy as a whole. Um, and that's what this first thing does. The, <coughs> the thing I'm calling rho L is a way you can calculate in a SRAFA framework what's the overall increase in labor productivity that would come from any technical change in any industry. What no SRA and, and the SRAFians hadn't really done this. Um, their project and what they were interested in, they didn't really need to do this. Um, but we need to do this. The second thing, the second theorem has to do with, well, in this framework, can you rigorously calculate and measure overall throughput efficiency, increases in overall throughput efficiency? And what I'm calling rho n is the way to do that. Um, and <coughs> these, the, 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 the beta prime and the alpha prime are basically the dominant eigenvalue in a particular socio-economy matrix that's part of the Sraffian framework of how it is that you look at a complicated economy with all sorts of interrelations between industries that has primary inputs from nature and from labor. Um, so it's the ability to sort of rigorously model those two trends that are caused by changes in technology that I think offers some ability to sort of clarify this historic debate that we've had. Um, so what's the implication for steady state and degrowth? 
What I'm trying to do is sort out what I call the sense from the nonsense. Um, consider a worst case scenario. <laughs> Assume we take none of our increases in productivity in the form of leisure. Now, I'm not suggesting that this would be a wise thing to do. I'm trying to establish a worst case scenario. Also, in our vector of outputs, what we produce in the economy, surely we can substitute some outputs that are less that that are less throughput intensive for outputs that are more throughput intensive and of course that's what a sensible strategy is going to require us to do but i'm going to go ahead and assume a worst case scenario we don't make any substitutions in what we consume and we don't take any of our productivity increases in the form of more leisure I'm going to make two simplifying assumptions that are really kind of arbitrary. You, of course, you'd go back and fix these. I'm going to assume that labor force doesn't grow and the number of hours we work stays the same. Well, this is a pretty bad scenario, you know, from the point of view of can you possibly imagine sort of a sustainable outcome with increases in, 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 with increases in economic well-being in that scenario. Um, but here's what it comes down to. Um, I should mention this, that I'm well aware that defining, conceptualizing, much less measuring economic well-being is incredibly complicated. I understand that. Um, in a Sarafa, sometimes a simple framework, you know, is useful precisely because it's so simple that the complicated problems have been assumed away. In a Sarafa framework, there the only, the only source of an increase in well-being is can we get the same goods spending less hours to do it? So an increase in la overall labor productivity is the only, it's the only part of a Sarafa framework that has anything to do with economic well-being. Um, so that being said, <coughs> at least in theory, it's possible for hours work to remain constant, labor productivity, which equates to economic well-being in a Sarafa framework, to rise, and for throughput to remain constant, provided throughput efficiency rises as fast as labor productivity. So basically, the entire issue reduces to the relationship between increases in throughput efficiency and increases in labor productivity. Um, both of which can be measured in a very rigorous way in a Srafa framework, and neither of which can be measured easily in any other framework that I'm aware of. Essentially, as long as throughput, that big letter NX, tells you how much throughput we have every year, as long as that is less than the regenerative capacity of nature, um, then, in fact, throughput efficiency doesn't even have to rise as fast as labor productivity can. Once you've basically reached the point where nature isn't going to regenerate any faster than the throughput, then a sufficient condition under a worst-case scenario for <coughs> environmental sustainability is simply that throughput efficiency has to rise as fast as labor, as labor productivity does. Um, and then, of course, if it turns out that we have already surpassed the regenerative capacity of nature in some capacity, then, of course, labor productivity cannot rise as fast as throughput efficiency. Whoops, I lost a bunch of things. When I'm done. When I'm done. Oh, really? <laughs> really? Okay. All right. Well, let me mention one other thing. Um, <coughs> the truth of the matter is, and this is very important for anybody that's sort of look carefully into the ecological footprint. The truth of the matter is that the nature is very heterogeneous. It's not homogeneous. 
Um, and throughput, therefore, depends on which part. Are we talking about my carbon footprint? Are we talking about carbon throughput? Are we talking about, you know, throughput that's soil? So what I have said so far basically is in a framework where we're saying we're just assuming that there is this homogeneous nature that's one of the inputs in production processes. It's very similar to assuming there's homogeneous labor. Labor isn't homogeneous either. Well, can the framework tell us anything useful if we now want to deal with a world where we know that different parts of nature, both, both natural resources and sinks, are in fact quite different, need to be measured in different units, et cetera, et cetera. And yes, the framework can still be quite useful in that regard. What about the assumption, what about the assumption that, well, we're going to assume this, think about it, think about this. If we only have one input from nature, homogeneous nature, then you can't have sustainability if nature is non-reproducible at all. So we have a very important distinction. We have, we have parts of nature that do regenerate to some extent in a time frame that is, you know, that, that's, that's of some use. And then we have parts of nature that don't. So, you know, take iron ore. There's only so much of it. Um, and yes, we could dig deeper, and yes, we could put up with, you know, lower grade deposits, but it is a non-renewable. It, it doesn't regenerate. Does that mean that the whole notion of sustainability, you know, is absolutely, it's logically impossible? Well, if we only think of nature as being a single primary input, then unless it regenerates, then using any of it, of course, at some point becomes unsustainable. On the other hand, nature is not homogeneous. In fact, it's heterogeneous. And one of the important things is to figure out which things are we running out of fastest and which things do regenerate and which things don't. So is the whole project of thinking that we can engage in some sort of process that allows for increases in economic well-being, in this framework just simply allowing labor productivity to continue to grow, and make that consistent with what I would call a sustainable strategy. Um, I don't think that project is impossible or unattractive at all. Um, so let me... And, and here's the political implication. Um, if it were true, if it were really true that it is impossible for economic well-being to increase on average on the planet over the next, over this century without damaging the economy, bringing on climate change, if that were true, we should go out and tell people that. But if that's not true, tell it, giving the impression that that's what we think and that's what we want to make happen basically guarantees that three billion people in the third world who have never enjoyed the benefits of economic development are not going to sign on to our campaign if we tell them oh you're going to even be worse off your living standards are going to have to be even worse off than they were before and if you take a look at the pressure that the lower middle class and working class people are in most advanced economies, you really want to go and tell them that they cannot even aspire to a higher standard of living for their children than they are enjoying at this point. That's committing political suicide. It's making enemies out of the people who are our most logical allies. It is basically creating an impossible political task. Now, if it were necessary because there is no other answer, then I'd say fine. On the other hand, I think that sloppy thinking about growth of what? Are you talking about growth of well-being? Are you talking about growth of throughput? Then I think that giving that impression, I think, is politically suicidal, and it's a terrible mistake that our movement and cause has been making. Okay. Thank you.